from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Some improvement for the dairy industry. We look at the latest numbers when it comes to milk production as livestock producers work to protect the herd after a destructive insect shows up south of the border. Plus, we know President-elect Trump's nominee for Secretary of Ag, but what does she bring to the table and what could it mean for the future of USDA? But she can get on the phone and call him directly. A deeper dive into the selection right now on Ag Day. Ag Day is brought to you by Pioneer. Ben's bins, please hold. Yeah, Ben's has been busy all day. Seems like no one can keep up with this new Z series. What did you all put in these seeds? Science. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Reaction is coming in after President-elect Trump announces his nominee to be the next Secretary of Agriculture. We first told you on Monday, Brooke Rollins of Texas has been nominated to serve as the 33rd Secretary of Agriculture. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins me. Michelle, the announcement comes after several people were named as possibilities and even after reports another person had been selected. Yeah, Clinton, after the roller coaster regarding Trump's Secretary of Agriculture pick, we know that Brooke Rollins is steeped in policy and served as a policy advisor in the first Trump administration. She was most recently CEO of the America First Policy Institute, which aligns with the president-elect's agenda on many ag issues. And she was on the shortlist for White House Chief of Staff, which may be her biggest asset for agriculture. The resume of the U.S. Secretary of Ag nominee is impressive. Brooke Rollins is a Texas farm girl who earned degrees including ag development at Texas universities. She ran a state-level think tank before working in the first Trump administration as director of the Domestic Policy Council and most recently headed a think tank that aligns with Trump's agenda. But it's her relationship with Trump that makes her so valuable. I think she's going to be similar to the way Dick Ling was as USDA secretary under President Reagan. Uh, he knew Dutch Reagan, as he called Reagan, on a personal basis. Brooke Rollins knows uh, Donald Trump on a personal basis. So not that she'll have to, but she can get on the phone and call him directly. In the past, Rollins has supported ag research in banning foreign ag land ownership, and she says she'll fight to protect U.S. ag interests. The most important thing is that agriculture has a voice in the Oval Office that advocates for them and talks about why uh, policies, things that the administration may do, how it impacts agriculture. Having a champion in the room is the most important thing. And who she picks for her staff will be an important clue about how she'll run USDA. Having a deputy that's strong in production ag, undersecretaries that are strong in production ag, those are all going to be very, very important for agriculture over the next four years. Wiesmeyer says Trump's push for government efficiency will also include USDA. This is going to be some uh, initiatives that she'll have to implement, and that includes worker requirements for the food stamp program. Watch for that. And Rollins is expected to support and execute Trump's trade and tariff policy. He wants allies. He wants his plan to be executed, and she'll work closely with the Treasury Department Secretary, Bissett, Scott Bissett. She'll work closely with the National Economic uh, Council Director, uh, and she'll work closely with Commerce Secretary. So yes, absolutely, that she'll be in lockstep on his trade policy. That is a bit of a concern for the American Farm Bureau. We will make the case that we think there are better ways to begin the negotiations, uh, obviously with the tariff hammer in your back pocket. But Rollins is a consensus builder, and so Vanderwall is hopeful they can work with her on trade and other policy and are encouraged with her record of protecting farmers. And she made a statement that she's ready to fight and stand up for agriculture in this country, especially with the economic situation we have. So we're encouraged by that, and we think we'll be able to have a good working relationship. The American Soybean Association and National Cattlemen's Beef Association congratulated Rollins on the nomination, saying her policy experience will be valuable, as well as her record of rolling back regulations. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. And there could be changes coming soon to leadership 
for the Democrats on the House Ag Committee. Representative Jim Cost of California announcing on X his intention to run for the ranking member position on the committee. That would be a challenge against current ranking member Representative David Scott of Georgia. Now, Scott has recently been receiving treatment for back problems. Farm Journal Washington correspondent Jim Wiesmeyer also reporting that Representative Angie Craig is weighing a bid, and there could be other contenders, such as Connecticut Representative Johanna Hayes. Another developing story we're following, concern about the return of a fly that could impact cattle caused cattle prices to surge on Monday. Mexico's chief veterinary officer informing USDA about a confirmed case of New World screw worm. It was found in Chiapas near the Guatemala border. The fly larva can infest warm-blooded animals, even humans, causing severe infections. Because of the finding, APHIS has increased import restrictions on animal products from Mexico. Producers are also being urged to inspect livestock and pets for any signs of infection, including wounds or larvae. USDA says it's taking several steps to protect U.S. livestock, including those stricter controls on animal products coming into the country, increased surveillance at border crossings, and working with Mexican authorities to address the situation at its source. Health officials in California report avian flu was detected in a retail sample of raw milk. The California Department of Public Health is warning the public to avoid consuming one batch of cream top whole raw milk produced and packaged by Raw Farm of Fresno County. It says the company has issued a voluntary recall of the affected raw milk. Officials report no illnesses have been reported and public health experts have been warning consumers against drinking raw milk due to elevated risks of foodborne illness. They continue to say pasteurized milk is safe to drink. Placements of cattle appear to still be strong despite cattle inventories remaining relatively tight. That's the headline from this month's Cattle on Feed report. USDA Livestock Analyst Michael McConnell says producers continue to place more animals in feedlots in October, 5% more year over year. You know, it appears that strong prices for feeder cattle as well as, uh, you know, strong, strong demand for, for beef is continue to encourage producers to place their cattle in feedlots and, and have them fed out for, for beef production. USDA says 750 to 800 pound feeders have been averaging $254 per hundred weight. That's about 4% higher than a year ago. Rain and snow could impact parts of the country during a busy travel week. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joins us with where those impacts are most likely. Yeah, coming up into that Thanksgiving holiday, we are tracking a couple of systems moving across the United States. And while there could be some travel problems, especially in the Northeast, it's more about the cold air behind this that is going to encompass a large portion of the United States. So again, this is Thursday at 7 o'clock in the morning. The cold air is still back up here to the north. So this is mainly going to be all rain into the southeast, a changeover uh, to some rain, maybe some snow back into Pennsylvania up here to the northeast uh, as we go into our Thursday and Friday. But you see the clear skies back out here to the west and, and the Midwest uh, up until the plains. That is some very cold, a very heavy, cold, dry air mass settling in across uh, parts of the nation. We could see some lake effects though as well. This is Friday morning uh, into Saturday and Sunday with that north to northwest flow bringing in some of the snow showers, the lake effect snow showers into parts of the Midwest. Again, there's Friday at 11 a.m. Some of this will start to clear out into the weekend. And we kept you updated last week about all the snow and rain on the West Coast. The UC Berkeley Central Sierra Snow Lab reporting it saw just over 19 inches of snow over a 24 hour period last Thursday. Then the area saw even more rain and snow. So a good start to the snowpack season. And I'm sure we're going to be checking in with UC Berkeley Central Sierra Snow Lab more this season as well. Monday saw another mixed day to start the Thanksgiving week. We'll talk commodity markets as we wrap up November next. And later, avian flu and dairy cattle is impacting milk production numbers. We have the latest trends in our dairy report today after weather. Ag Day is brought to you by Pivot Bio. Protect yield potential with a new mode of action in nitrogen. See how Pivot Bio fits into your fertility plan at talknitrogen.com.
The world's largest meat packer is about to get even bigger. Brazilian meat packer JBS inking a deal with Nigeria. The plan is to invest $2.5 billion in the African country, including building six new factories. JBS saying in a statement three of the factories would handle poultry, two would be dedicated to beef and another to pork. The memorandum of understanding with the company says JBS will build up a five-year investment plan in Nigeria, including feasibility studies and budget estimates. The government of Nigeria, in turn, would ensure the economic, sanitary, and regulatory conditions needed to make the plan happen. USDA reported a big flash sale of corn to Mexico, but it wasn't enough to pull corn out of the Monday doldrums. Ag News' Michelle Rook has better news about the livestock sector in markets now. A mixed day in cattle and grains on Monday. Kent Beetle with Paradigm Futures is back with us. Okay, cattle market, a pretty volatile day. You had talk about screw worm and higher cash trade, kind of competing with a bearish cattle and feed report, right? Yeah, it was reported that uh, some cattle were found to have a screw worm uh, and that had originated out of Mexico. And uh, the reports were that the border was then going to close. Um, yeah, that could result in, you know, a disruption of as many as 100,000 feeder cattle per month. And uh, so we ended up with a, a sharply higher open on Monday, uh, you know, in both cattle and feeder cattle, feeder cattle up over $5 at one point. Uh, but it, it's like many uh, pieces of news, when you don't get the full story, it becomes difficult to trade it. And, uh, you know, ultimately, we had another piece of news from last Friday, which was the cattle on feed report. The cattle on feed report, of course, had told us that we had a 104 percent um, of a year ago cattle uh, that had been placed into feedlots. And uh, that's a little additional supply and, you know, that the kind of offset the bullishness. No doubt. So it means uh, we actually ended higher, but off session highs here too. Was that market, you know, building off the reversal from Friday or were we still trying to trade some of these rumors that China is buying more beans? Certainly there have been rumors of additional Chinese sales. We believe Chinese sales are going to be ongoing through the month of December, uh, except the window that we're selling into is, is a little more narrow. So uh, the size of the sales are going to start to come down. Um, we also had a, a really reasonably good uh, uh, export inspections report on Monday. And corn faded some big Mexican business. Why? Probably the main reason is that we're a couple days away from first notice day. And uh, there are a lot of December basis contracts out there that still need to get priced. And so, um, you know, with... Uh, uh, with the, an early rebound in the corn market, uh, we saw some hedge pressure in the corn. Um, you know, and corn also was reacting to the lower wheat trade. All right, thanks so much, Kim Beetle with Paradigm Futures. We'll have more Ag Day coming up. Yeah, it's up to your outlook between the 2nd and the 8th. It really shows you kind of that winter pattern setting up. A late fall, early winter pattern uh, where you have a cold air, the coldest air uh, for nearly two-thirds of the United States, almost half the United States. And then you come back here where a ridge of high pressure is going to dominate with warmer than average conditions. So, so the closer you are to the coast, uh, the warmer it is going to be. At least the odds are a lot higher on the west coast. And the colder uh, it's going to be, at least the odds are higher on the East Coast. This is from the second to the eighth, and it doesn't take much now for some energy to swing down from the north combined with some moisture and see a few you know, possibly uh, snowfall uh, events uh, events unfolding as we go into the middle, if not uh, possibly even late December. But look at the map as of right now, November 30th through December 4th. Uh, we are drier than normal through a large portion of the United States. That's through the 4th. Once we get on the other side and into December, the likelihood of some of these uh, weaker systems to come through and bring snow across the Midwest, the Plains, but also the Northeast starts to increase a little bit right in the middle part of December, if not the second half uh, of December. So here's a look at the jet stream. Again, uh, through the course of the next couple of days, it's all about the cold air mass. You can see how much it changes uh, the jet stream Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, Thanksgiving, and Friday, and Saturday. This will come with some travel impacts for the Northeast as we transition from that warmer to colder, but I'm not expecting a massive system to impact a large portion of the United States. So one thing that we do have to, con have to concentrate on 
uh, Thanksgiving and going into the weekend is that domino effect. If we do have a few airport delays, how that is going to translate uh, downstream. There's a jet stream coming up on Monday. That is a big signal for some colder than average temperatures through the East Coast and the Northeast. Start off with Billings, Montana, mostly cloudy, high around 39 degrees, low of 23 degrees. Billings, Missouri, mostly sunny, high of 53, low of 37. And finally, you guessed it, Billings, West Virginia, morning clouds, high around 49. Some good news in the recent U.S. milk production report. It shows despite a decline in production throughout most of the year, there's been an unexpected resurgence lately, creating a year-over-year -year increase of just 0.4%. Now, speaking to DairyHerd.com, Phil Plord of Everdon Ag attributes it to the effects of HPAI in California. He says that led to a significant decrease in production in the state, but he says outside of California, milk production grew at a healthy clip. October milk production across the 24 major states reached a total of 18 billion pounds. Production per cow averaged 2,013 pounds. The report also showing an increase in the number of milk cows on farms, totaling 8.92 million head. That's an increase of 21,000 from the previous year. For an in-depth look at the numbers, check out this story over at dairyherd.com. China says it's expanding its scope of its anti-subsidy investigation into dairy imports from the EU. It will now expand it to Denmark, France, Italy, and the Netherlands. China launching the investigation into imports of some cheese, milk, and cream from the EU in August. That's after the EU announced a tariff plan for Chinese-made electric vehicles. Those EV tariffs of up to 45% took effect at the end of last month. Now, the EU is China's second largest source of dairy products behind New Zealand. Hey, we all know that office admins make the world go round. Up next, we'll find out what a group of them were doing in Tennessee today in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Help keep African swine fever out of the U.S. by updating your biosecurity plan. Learn more at aphis.usda.gov slash protect our pigs. Administrative assistants or admins in ag are a vital part of many organizations. As the University of Tennessee's Charles Denny reports, the university recently hosted a national conference for them. He has more on these unsung heroes of the office. A high stakes game of grown up indoor field hockey that resembles a rugby scrum. Getting your whacks and kicks at Tursa just one of the team building activities at the national meeting for the Extension and Research Support Staff Association. It was held at the Hartsong Lodge at Dollywood. Admin, 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 admin. The Tursa conference included workshops for professional development opportunities that included some creative exercises and titles. Uh, we talked about from rattled to irreplaceable, and what does an irreplaceable admin look like? You know, and they're organized. They have good time management, right? Sometimes they eat the frog, and we're gonna learn in a session here today about eating the frog. Which task do you do that maybe is the biggest and the ugliest, and you eat that first? More than 150 administrative professionals are here representing Tennessee and six other states. The goal, network, learn, inspire, and energize. Regina Neal works as an admin in Memphis, but perhaps a better title for her would be ambassador for TSU Extension in Shelby County. You gotta love what you're doing. I understand the responsibility that goes with that. I want to leave a good impression, not only for Shelby County, but for all of Extension. And so I try to bring with me a certain amount of excitement People here from other states agree admins are often a great connection to the public. 
but they are the first uh, smiling face you see, and they can really make or break that relationship for the person walking in the door. It's hoped these conference attendees head home with a renewed sense of purpose and connection. They should all know they're appreciated and valued. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, thanks, Charles. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.